Lucha, 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 Ultima Lucha, that is. And welcome, everybody, to Underground Lucha Things. I'm your host, R. Felix Finch, somebody who, despite having spent so much time around this, is finally, 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 after over five years finishing season one of Underground Lucha, of uh, Lucha Underground, and I'm... I may be alone in my experience, but I'm not alone on this show, because joining me from the Isle of Hawaii, the one, the only, Angie FN of Midcard Mana. Angie, how are you doing today? Bang, bang. I am good. Thank you for having me on this Ultima Lucha adventure. Yes. Uh, it's, been, it's, been so, it's been so good. It's been so good. I cannot believe I skipped out on this, but you know what? Like I said, I didn't have El Rey Network, so... It's not my fault. It's your fault. Different television services I've had throughout time. Actually, you know what? I don't think I had any television services. I just think I didn't have streaming. <laughs> so, Ultima Lucha. We're gonna st we're gonna do it all as one chunk. So, this is a th this is a three hour essentially pay per view. We're compressing into thirty minutes. Here we go. We're ta we're gonna start talking about part one, which aired July 29th, twenty fifteen. It was only an hour. And it starts off with Black Lotus doing chin-ups in her prison cell as Dario comes to greet her wearing a tux and sipping champagne. He tells the story of his brother's upbringing and says that despite his brother being called a monster, it's just the way that he was trained. And he also reveals that, allegedly, Matanza didn't do anything to her, her parents. It was Dragon Azteca that killed her parents and blamed Matanza. And as he leaves, uh, Black Lotus starts fighting a silhouette she's made on the wall out of con uh, nearly punching through the concrete and it's nice that they gave her chalk in her prison cell yeah great first segment with a you know very appropriate season finale opening twist with that you know everything that she's believed so far with with you know Matanza Cueto being responsible for the death of her family nope was the person who trained her, El Dragon Azteca. What the twist. But we're starting out. We wanted violence. We have the Mac versus Cage in Falls Count Anywhere. And the fight starts at the top of the stairs with Cage attacking the Mac during his entrance. They quickly go over to the Batman corner and the fight even goes into the Believers. The Mac suplexing Cage into the solid wood steps. A fire extinguisher and 2 by 4 even make their way into the match. And the Believers are already shouting for tables. The Mac gets some beers and delivers a stunner, uh, Stone Cold style, even doing a little uh, hover taunt. Cage soon uh, sates the crowd's taste for tables, by being si but ends up being sent by one himself, uh, sent through one himself by the Mac, though he is able to kick out. Uh, surprisingly, the Mac is the one getting the most pinning opportunities. He seems to be the one on the attack most often. Cage being the resilient athlete, but Cage wins with the insane choice of giving the Mac a curb stomp through a cinder block up in the Batman corner. Absolute madness. And you know what? It felt about just the right length of opening. And if you're going to start, start hot. I can't agree more. That definitely, you know, not the longest match uh, compared to some other matches that, you know, us wrestling fans sit through 30 minute, 60 minute matches. It was short and sweet, but it gave everyone what they wanted very early on. And that was a nice, brutal match between two hosses. Hoss fight, indeed. Now, I think the thing that I think I want to build upon just slightly for yours is talking about Cage is a resilient athlete, a resilient performer. I definitely appreciated the the black and yellow sort of Wolverine nod of his gear. <laughs> and that kind of, I think, adds to that sort of narrative of, you know, him being very resilient, him being able to take the beating and keep getting up and keep going for more, you know, Weapon X after all. So I thought this was a great, fun opening match. Uh, a good curtain warmer, as they say. I absolutely agree. And... After that, we get a championship match. We have the Disciples of Death versus... Uh, sorry, we have the Disciples of Death, who we finally get some names for. 
They are Barrio Negro, sorry, Barrio Negro, Trece, and El Sinestro de la Muerte. I don't know what any of those means. I think one means black bar. I think uh, one, I guess, I don't know. Does it mean three? I have no idea. And Sinestro, the evil of the dead? I have no idea. But they're with Katrina versus Son of Havoc, Ivelisse, and Angelica who are defending their Lucha Underground Trios Championships. And this is Tornado Tag Rules, so we don't have to keep track of tags. So nice. And it's... And, uh... Ivelisse is still on her crutches. They are... Uh, the Disciples are quickly in control of the champ, uh, champs. Uh, Son of Havoc and Angelico find their wings and start flying everywhere to get themselves a hand up. While Ivelisse uses her crutch as a weapon on the putties, there's actual teamwork between the champions, which is refreshing. And Angelico comes through with a massive dive onto all three of the Disciples from the perch. Uh, Katrina enters the ring and resurrects them by holding the stone up. And uh, Ivelisse hobbles in and uh, throws her crutches to the side. Uh, Ivelisse gets a top man on Katrina, starts hitting her, and is briefly able to overtake Katrina. But uh, Katrina is able to get the stone and just hits her in the head, knocks her out. And a disciple slides in and covers the unconscious Ivelisse. So the Disciples of Death are your new trios champions uh wow kind of unexpected boo, 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 boo the heels boo especially because i love uh son of havoc ivelisse and angelico as a trios team and i was so excited as i mentioned several times through our, our recaps at how much I loved the storytelling going on between those three and getting to see them come together as a team. So that one hit me hard. That one hit me hard, hurt me a little bit more than, than I thought it was going to, especially on this rewatch. But definitely very high, high velocity, high octane. There it is, high octane match, especially getting to see Angelico, you know, being Angelico getting to see Ivelisse kind of throw down a little bit with Katrina. Is, is this the last time we're going to get to see them go at each other? Who knows? But, you know, the outcome was not as surprising to me because I kind of felt, especially with the stone and everything going on, you know, she was, she was going to find a way to snake the gold away from my favorite trios tag team. It was what it was. Speaking of things being what they are, we've got Hernandez and Drago with a Believers Backlash match. And I can't speak for everybody ringside, but I can tell you for sure that there, the fan, uh, that, uh, there are actually fans that are to the side. Because there's one that they keep calling Hot Tub Guy. I know that guy, Sean Scoville. Great dude. He is one. <laughs> he's the one that really sticks out. As far as I know, zero wrestling training, but is one of the best effing fans in the world. I absolutely love that dude. He does great interviews. Uh, look up Hot Tub interviews or look up Wrestler Hot Tub on YouTube, not any other websites, because I just can't guarantee what you'll get there. But uh, yeah, you'll see that he puts out some really, really cool content. But yeah, he's one of the ones ringside, so um, holy shit, I cannot believe that they are just letting fans have belts and whip wrestlers. Though I'm sure a lot more shows would be interesting if there was the possibility of fans providing the damage. Hernandez quickly sends Drago out of the ring and is disappointed when he doesn't hear Drago being whipped. Uh, he chases Drago to the outside, and the Believers immediately chase him around the ring, whipping him with belts. Uh, he escapes to the relative safety of Drago, who's in the ring, and Drago quickly gets to working him over. He sends Hernandez back to the outside to get whipped by the Believers, and <laughs> Hernandez is doing the thing where he tries to call a timeout. Hernandez manages to disarm one Believer before getting back into the ring, and despite Hernandez power bombing Drago, the Believers start uh, cheering for him to the ire of Hernandez. Uh, he even gives Drago a razor's edge onto the Believers on the outside. But when Hernandez tries to dive onto Drago, he gets a face full of mist instead. And Hernandez <laughs> escapes to under the ring. And the fans are just looking for him. When he emerges, he immediately starts getting beaten down again. And 
Drago finally has those nunchucks. Those nunchucks we see him practicing with in every promo. He has the nunchucks and breaks them on Hernandez before putting Hernandez onto a table and diving onto it from the corner. I believe this is the first time I've seen Drago dive through a table without face planting himself on the floor. So good job. That is progress. Uh, Drago tosses Hernandez into the ring, gets the win, and, you know, you leave the crowd going home happy. Man, this was a fun match. Yeah, as as fun as I had expected going back into it. I think knowing now what I didn't know before, it's made it seem even cooler. Um, and, you know, definitely it was very clear that they got they got some sort of marching orders of, you know, you don't you don't want to hit Drago. You want to hit Hernandez. And they had a clear understanding of, yeah, you're supposed to just hit the bad guy. Don't hit the good guy. Hit the bad guy. So I think that was that was a, a good touch to make it, I guess, maybe a little bit clearer to people who might just be, again, tuning in and randomly seeing a wrestling match. Uh, I, I really liked The Mist. I'm a big fan, you know. It's a very, it's a very Japanese wrestling thing. Doing the mist, um, probably also a very big lucha libre thing. I'm not as familiar with lucha libre, but definitely a very Japanese wrestling thing. And I always pop huge anytime somebody gets misted in the face. Always makes me happy. So that was to me a highlight. Also, okay, and this might sound, this might make me sound dumb, but I did not realize. I guess it never occurred to me that you could break nunchucks. <laughs> so that, if, they're if they're cheap that, enough. I mean, yeah, I guess you can break anything if it's cheap enough. But that was the thing that made me like, ah, when I saw it. Because it, for some reason, couldn't didn't occur to me that nunchucks could or would break. But like that just, that that made me cringe in pain really hard i liked it it was good it was a real fun match and again this is the main event of night one but there is a post credit scene because post credits we get dragon azteca going to the temple to rescue black lotus and he gets into a brief like kung fu battle like it looks like he's doing wing chun not exactly lucha libre and with a mysterious door guard who says that if he enters the temple he will die according to a prophecy and uh, dragon azteca says that Though he may die, oh, Dragon Azteca lives forever. And as he's allowed into the temple, the door mysteriously shuts and the hooded guard disappears, leaving us with a real mystery at the end of night one. Ooh. Yeah, cliffhanger. Definitely very good uh, production quality overall. Feels very much like a season finale that you'd see on a TV show, um, which I like. Um, and I didn't realize how much I'd like it because it felt, yeah, it felt very much like a we're gearing up to the, the final episode of the season. Everything's going to come to a head. We're going to find out what's going to go on with El Dragonist. We're going to find out who's going to walk out of the temple champion. You know, they did an excellent job, and I think you and I both mentioned this throughout the other episodes, they did an excellent job hyping up how important this is. And this episode is no different. It is the first part of the season finale, but gets us even more excited for the second part where everything will be revealed. (laughs) Yes, and that second part is season one, episode 39, Ultima Lucha, part two, which aired on my dad's 45th birthday. August 5th oh. of 2015. And uh, because Vampiro's in a match tonight, uh, we have Australian sports commentator My- Mike Chiavello taking Vampiro's spot at the commentary table. So that was kind of cool. If you were wondering about that funny voice, yeah, Australian dude does a lot in combat sports and was living in Vegas at this time. So he wasn't a far call, so he wasn't a far call away to come do some Lucha Libre. And we start off with Johnny Mundo versus Alberto El Patron. And El Patron comes out wearing his mega championship from AAA and starts out the match without, uh, like, he takes off his shirt. He comes out with a shirt, but 
he starts off the match no shirt and he's throwing mundo into walls and into the commentary table he quickly starts attacking the arm uh, mundo escapes under the ring and when he leaves he surprises el patron with some pocket sand before, <laughs> before taking control over in the match after throwing him around to the outside johnny throws el patron into the ring and continues to attack him uh, keeping him on the ground el patron finds an opening for an attack of his own and even steals Johnny's taunt. The <laughs> uh, Patron gets Johnny with a clothesline over the top rope, but when, when you think you're going to see a dive, Mundo kicks Patron before launching into Patron with a corkscrew dive of his own. Patron manages to lock the armbar onto Mundo, but Johnny rolls to get himself to the corner of the ring, and uh, Mundo finds a way to hit a double stomp and end of the world, but Alberto kicks out of the end of the world. It was not the end of the world, no. Patron goes super kick, but Mundo pulls referee Marty Elias in the way, and it knocks out Marty Elias, so he misses Mundo tapping out to the armbar. And there's a shock as a woman with a weird bob haircut runs in, grabs El Patron's Mega Championship, and hits El Patron, and knocks him out with it, and it's revealed that this is Melina! Melina, who I didn't, A, I didn't recognize with her bob cut, and B, I had no idea Melina did anything in Lucha Underground. I interviewed <laughs> Melina, and we did not discuss Lucha Underground once. But Mundo is able to hit the end of the world. He gets the win. The two are making out and celebrating, but Alberto Opatron isn't finished yet. He tosses Johnny out the ring, throws him throughout the temple, finishes with throwing him through a glass window while he, uh, gives, he gives Melina a spanking. And Mundo, though, when he comes out of the window, he looks sliced to hell. Like, he has a head full of blood. It looks it looks pretty damn real. And I swear I saw him picking glass out of his head and, uh, and uh, hair. Because, uh, yeah, that was a hell of a visual to add at the end of the match as the baby face is celebrating, causing quite a bit of chaos there. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm actually glad that you didn't know that Melina was in it and it didn't get spoiled for you because your reaction to that was great. <laughs> um, and I know especially because there's so many people that you kind of know or have figured out as in Lucha Underground or were in Lucha Underground, uh, it's cool that you have a surprise. So I like that part. Definitely also uh, going back into some of the stuff in the match, these are two guys that know each other super well, both inside of Lucha Underground as well as in their time in other places besides Lucha Underground. And getting to see them really kind of have answers for each other in their in their interactions, I, I really liked because it I think it added to the suspense of who is going to win this match. You know, is it going to be... Johnny Mundo, who has kind of come out on top in many of his matches in Lucha Underground, is it going to be the fan favorite Alberto Patron? I mean, he started off take with his shirt off. Like, he took his shirt off before the match began, really. So that showed he was a little bit more serious, a little bit more determined. So I I really liked this match. I enjoyed I enjoyed also your surprise at Melina. But, yeah, yeah just good stuff all around. Um Props to Mundo for taking that window spot because that was for real. That was for real, for real. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, that didn't look. All right, it was a good thing that that was the last filming of the season. If that was real, because I mean, that looked pretty effing real to me. That did not look like he. W it did not look like he was supposed to be that bled up. So I don't know, but maybe we'll see. I have no idea. But what I do, yeah, it is. It is hard to tell. I mean, this is this is the main difference between this and a regular wrestling show is that this is a lot more presentational. So they do have a lot more width for perhaps special effects if they need to or choose to take it. Uh, who knows if they did? Who knows if Mundo was just a, a real G and just went through the window and cut himself up on that? But hardcore, man. Yeah, but we have Dragon Azteca in the temple, and he reaches this jail cell. He tells Black Lotus that he's going to get her out, but Dario Cueto was waiting in the bag, and he says 
that he has violated an ancient treaty by entering the temple and the penalty is death. And when Dario takes off his key and starts twirling it, instead of releasing Matanza, Black Lotus grabs Dragon's Tekka by the neck and gives him one, just a one-shot palm hit to the spine saying that was for her parents and it kills him. Like, we got... This is our second straight-up murder in this show. And... Uh, Black Lotus says she's leaving. Dario looks very concerned, and he says that she's started a war, so they must go to a new temple, but he's bringing Matanza with him. And so we know that that key now is the key to Matanza's cell. Well, apparently to all the cells. Apparently you only need one key. But, but we don't see Matanza as he's released. That was That was quite a twist. I'm kind of surprised she believed him after just one statement of, oh, no. My brother didn't kill your parents. That guy. That guy did it. Stockholm Syndrome, maybe? Who knows? Definitely, I was I was surprised that she went with it so easily and so quickly. But Dario can be a very convincing man, I guess. Apparently so. But what we have up next is Pentagon Jr. versus Vampiro in a Cero Meadow match, which apparently means anything goes. And... Vampiro comes out in sort of this dark bishop outfit. Looks great. And I can't wait to see how he performs. Uh, Pentagon starts with some chair shots before Vampiro can even finish his entrance. Uh, as they fight through the crowd, Vampiro was finally able to take off his entrance robe. And Pentagon moves, uh, removes the, pat, the uh, padding to slam Vampiro out of the concrete and starts throwing chairs at him and hitting him with others. And the match is stopped. As officials come to check out on Vampiro and take him out on a gurney. So, uh, we go to a commercial break. Wait, he isn't dead? Vampiro, surprise! C because Vampiro <laughs> gets up from the gurney when they come back from commercial, hits a few of the EMTs, go goes in and uh, starts pouring thumbtacks into the ring before slamming Pentagon onto them. Vampiro tries to dive onto Pentagon, but he moves out of the way and lands on the thumbtacks himself. And starts getting hit with light tubes by Pentagon. Uh, Pentagon also starts uh, cutting Vampiro with a broken bulb and licks the blood away. Vampiro stays standing as Pentagon keeps attacking him. But v Vampiro reverses his fortunes and tosses Pentagon into some light tubes in the corner. And just rips his mask straight up in half. Before it starts hitting him in the head. And I love that he's trying to keep the mask on despite it clearly just being like torn in two almost. And a vampiro brings in a table, gets the lighter fluid and a li lighter, lights the table on fire, and Pentagon sends him through that table. He is on fire himself. He rolls out of the ring. Pentagon pins him for the one, two, three, wins the match. Pentagon Jr. grabs the mic. And uh, Vampiro presents his arm and tells Pentagon to break it. So he obliges. And he calls for his master. And the master is revealed to be Vampiro, who responds with, You are ready, my son. And the crowd chants, Holy shit, because this is a holy shit moment. Or in the case of Vampiro, maybe it's an unholy shit. I'm glad that that, that was revealed to you finally. Because I thought that was like the most bonkers thing when I first watched it. And I was just like, oh, man, I was just like, I was blown away and getting, even, even watching it again and knowing what was going to happen. It was still very much like, Oh man, I remember this is so cool. And it speaks a lot to me of just how little we know about Vampiro in Lucha Underground specifically. Um, this this match, all throughout the match in general, was this kind of match, you know. Vampiro is not only a legend, but also kind of a hardcore legend. And getting to see that kind of intensity in a match, especially because light tubes aren't, really a mainstream thing not not really something you see in matches on television unless you're you know where to look and you order it and it's yeah anyway anyway uh definitely very interesting to expose more people to that style of wrestling which i've always really liked i'm a very big deathmatch person so i loved it i loved it <laughs> on the other hand i'm a sissy lala i 
like watching i i've been in i've seen actual war happen like i still get way more uncomfortable in death matches than i do watching actual death mainly it's because of this you know when actual death happens normally nobody involved really wants it to happen maybe the perpetrator of death wants it to happen but if you're a human being you kind of still don't want to kill somebody in a death match you are volunteering to just absolutely mutilate yourself and for why for what for k i have no idea it's just not my bag baby i mean uh you saw like how my emergency reaction hit when uh with the G-Raver spot in, uh, when we were at a GCW la last year. Yeah. Oh, oh, man. I'll never forget that. That was <laughs> just the spray of blood. It was, was going to sound horrible and sociopathic of me, but I was so stoked that I got to finally see a light tube thing live. I've always wanted to, and I never got the chance. And you saw the but worst I, <laughs> I did feel bad for him, though, because I was like, Whoa, and then I was like, oh god, that poor man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, ooh, oh no, that's not right. That's not supposed to happen. It's like that that was that was too deep, too deep, wrong place, too deep, too deep. Oh no. Oh yeah, that was <laughs> Ooh. Sorry, that that still gives me that, that still gives me a, 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 a sort of feeling. But you know what? Let's go on to talk about the Gift of the Gods Championship. This is a one fall match between Jack Evans, Big Rick, Phoenix, Sexy Star, Bengala, Edostar, and King Cuerno. And Big Rick starts off the match by clearing everybody out the ring. But when he goes to dive to the outside, the other six team up to attack him. This match does get to have a lot of what I talked about in multi-man matches, especially ones with odd numbers where people just sit around the outside and wait for their spots. Though we do get some great lucha things between Phoenix and Aerostar. Uh, Jack Evans has a great opportunity to show off his ability to fly before being stopped by a solid kick. Bengala is the first to almost get a pin on Sexy Star, but it's quickly broken up. Uh, Big Rip maintains his dominance over the Luchadors, but doesn't notice Aerostar, who does a dive onto three other competitors. Sexy Star then dives onto a group... Sorry. Sexy Star uh, is getting ready to dive, but Marty the Moth appears and tries to attack her. And though she fends him off, Sexy Star then dives on her group to the outside before Big Rick pulls her in by the hair. Uh, Cuerno gives her a thrill of the hunt, but instead of pinning Sexy Star with the move that he always pins people with, he just goes on to fight Phoenix. Apparently he wants the bigger prey. Bengala finally gets some time to get featured, as well as Aerostar with some extreme lucha speed. Jack Evans tries to overtake Aerostar, but he's greeted with the DDT. Big Rick gives Sexy Star an Uranagi that just absolutely ragdolls her, but it, but De, but Davari comes out and hits Big Rick with a chair, telling him that he is fired. And uh, Phoenix turns a up by Jack Evans into some knee strikes and a fire driver to get the win and earn the Gifts of the God title. Man, this was an insane match. Definitely, and I I just want to point out the the. Un, I shouldn't say underdog, but the like dark horse kind of highlight to me in this match that I didn't think was going to be was Bengala. Getting to see Bengala be a little bit more aggressive, showing a little bit more of his skill. What a great moment for him. And to be able to stand out amongst all these competitors that people know a little bit better could Good stuff, man. Such such good shit, as they say. But also, uh, I I love you know because I love Marty the Moth. I love the Marty the Moth run in, uh, the tussle with Sexy Star, and it wasn't a surprise that Sexy Star was able to overcome that. But just very interesting that Marty is still got a got a bone to pick. You know, definitely not something I would have expected from Marty the Moth because we we haven't really seen much of him as a character yet aside from you know sort of ascended fanboy kind of status so i'm very interested as to what this could possibly mean for him you know damn well what this means for him i don't know what it means for him but but exactly <laughs> but uh 
But I will say, I mean, again, he did have, a, he's shown that he has skill. He had a great showing when he had the Lucha Underground Championship opportunity with uh, with Prince Puma. But that's, but that's not here nor there. We're going to talk about the next match, which is Mexico versus Mexico to find out who the true Mexico is. Who is a Mexico? Tejano versus Blue Demon Jr. And oh, I don't know that. No way. says that was the French accent. Oh, oh. But this is the first proper match we've seen from Blue Demon since damn near the beginning of the series. Uh, Blue Demon Jr. is accompanied by the crew who are in their best suits. And due to Blue Demon Jr.'s legendary status, Dario has made this match no disqualification. So the crew immediately tries to get involved with the match, but Tejano's aggression allows him to get rid of them both and battle Blue Demon. Uh, Tejano almost ends the match easy with a powerbomb, but the crew get in with a cane, which Blue Demon accepts. And as he goes to cane Tejano, Chavo suddenly appears with a chair and faces off with Blue Demon. But instead, he hits Tejano with a chair and hands it to Blue Demon, encouraging him to do the same. Blue Demon does, and he gets the pin... But as the victory celebration is happening, he kind of looks around and backs away. He's uh, He looks like he's starting to regret what he did while Chavo and the crew continue to taunt Tejano. Um, kind of an anticlimactic match, but it feels like it's doing something story-wise. Yeah, no, definitely not the longest match uh, in the card. Uh, but leaves you leaves you wondering what... What's gonna be next? And you know, I, I don't I don't give Chavo the praise he deserves, but Chavo is really good at advancing story. You know, he knows he might not be the, the main character in every in everything he does, but he knows his part and he plays it damn well. And it's always compelling. So good good really good good story here. I'm excited to see how this story unfolds. Who lives, who dies, who tells a story? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to my boy, main boy, Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> 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 nah, but we have our main event. It is Mil Muertes with Katrina versus Prince Puma, who is defending the Lucha Underground Championship. And by order of Dario Cueto, there must be a winner. So uh, Puma doesn't move at first, but he does approach Mill and starts hitting him with punches before getting flashy, not realizing that Mill Muertes was still upright. He gets thrown out of the ring, and Mill starts taking him around the temple. Prince Puma uses a surprising tactic and uses Katrina as a weapon to fight Mill, uh, though Mill clears the fans from ringside and throws Puma into the chairs. Puma shows off his agility with some Spider-Man-like counters and offense on the outside. Uh, Puma tries to bring out a table, but Mill turns that against him. Puma tricks Mill into running into a chair that's set up in the corner and uh, also shows off some strength by lifting Mill onto his shoulders and throwing him up to give him the kick, but but uh, Mill kicks out when Katrina holds the stone high. The stone is very important, apparently. The Puma continues his incredibly athletic attacks. Puma's on the apron, and Mill goes and spears him. And instead of going through the table, he goes kind of to the side of the table. Like, he almost completely misses the table. And it breaks. And it <laughs> and it breaks the legs, but doesn't break the table. Mill quickly course corrects. Gives a power bomb into the Gives a power bomb into the table that is... Now angled up, so he breaks that before throwing Puma in. Mill gives Puma a smooth spinning choke slam, but Puma is able to hit a trio of kicks to put Mill into position for a 630, which Mill kicks out of. And I think that's the first time we've seen anybody kick out of the 630. Puma goes for a second 630, but Mill gets out of the way and answers with a massive spear before delivering a flatliner, which I swear Puma took like on his neck and chin. Before flipping over, and uh, Puma somehow kicks out of that. Mill delivers a classic punch to the face to try to keep Puma down. But when uh, Puma goes to the top rope, Mill jumps to the top rope and delivers a super flat liner, which, as simple as that move looks, I've never seen it, and I think that's a brilliant move. Mill pins Puma for the win and to become the new Lucha Underground Champion. 
the trio's champions, the Disciples of Death, join Mill and Katrina in the ring after Katrina delivers her lick of death, and they show off their gold and the new future of Lucha Underground. Definitely the dark future of Lucha Underground. It very, very much feels like a big triumphant match ending for the bad guys. Uh, I, The thing I think the part of the match that hit me the hardest, no pun intended, um, was just watching Puma just get swatted like a fly by that chair as he was trying, just like diving out of the ring, just watching it pump. I'm just like, oh, oh my. I think I think I have a concussion after that. That was rough. And, you know, it's just one of those things, you know, as much as you can practice and pull your punches and not hit 100% on chair shots, a chair shot is still a chair shot. And if somebody is actively diving into your chair shot, whew, whew, that, that's the stuff that hits me hard is the, the, the concussion stuff. Um, but definitely a very impactful uh, image in the ring at the end of that match. For sure. And something we don't get with wrestling a lot, it, like this would kind of be a pay-per-view. Something I've never seen a pay-per-view do is an epilogue, which we get. <laughs> and yep. So the first section, I'm going to talk about all of them and then we'll just kind of talk about them. We So we start with Black Lotus in Dario's office post credits and they are hastily packing up his office he almost leaves his bull behind. Like, they leave the office. He runs back to get that red bull you always see, which I think is a like, just charming bit of humanity. They jump into his SUV, which is hauling a mystery masked figure, which I'm pretty sure that's our first look at Matanza's mask. I'm assuming that's Matanza in the trailer. But, like, it's a mask we've never seen before. So, that's cool. Meanwhile, Phoenix has his Gift of the Gods Championship. And he gets into his clearly marked Pontiac Firebird, <laughs> <laughs> and with his and uh, he drives out of the temple. But you see, he's being followed by King Cuerno's truck, who we've seen in a, a few segments, along with King Cuerno in his cowboy outfit at, but mask. Meanwhile, Marty the Moth is in a room going crazy with a light, cause get it, he's a moth, and we see that he has sexy star tied up. With way too much rope, like that, he has an inconvenient amount of rope tying her up, and he says that if she's laughing now, she won't be laughing when he me she meets his sister. Who is his sister? Do we have a lady moth? Is it Mothra? Please let it be Mothra. I don't know what to expect <laughs> from this show, but Mothra would just icing on the cake. Meanwhile. Angelico is on a dirt bike, and you see Son of Havoc approach him and say they're going to go get their gold back. And as Angelico drives off, he goes up to Ivelisse, who's on her cruiser. I want to say Harley, but I can't, confer I can't confirm that it's a Harley. But she's on a motorcycle, and he's like, what do you say, babe? One last ride? She tells him to shut up as, he's, as he goes to ride bitch. Oh, how sweet. He rides bitch. <laughs> And they drive off into the sunset. Meanwhile, <laughs> Drago and Aerostar are shaking hands like Viking style. And Drago <laughs> says that they'll meet again and exits with a fireball. The kind of same way we've seen him leave before. Which is nothing because Aerostar goes out to leave and he looks up. And when we zoom back out, we see that there's like sparklers coming down like he's like <laughs> like as if he actually just launched himself into space. So is Aerostar a sentient spaceship? Is is that what's been going on this entire time? Are we learning something new? Meanwhile, Pentagon Jr. is asking his master where they're going and Vampiro, now looking like Emperor Palpatine, says to a much darker place. Meanwhile, that mystery bouncer, Dragon Azteca fought, seems to now be putting on the Dragon Azteca match. And you can see the facial hair is different. So this isn't Dragon Azteca. This is somebody totally new. And he leaves a giant question mark spray painted on Lucha Libre's billboard like some kind of Batman villain. Meanwhile, 
Dario is seen kind of drifting out of the temple. Like, he's not really walking. He's just, like, floating out of his te- the temple, and things are turning off behind him. And he starts smiling, and he's wiping his brow, and he starts smiling a sinister smile. And he starts heading into some red light. And that's our final image before we get to be continued. Man! What do you think about this ep- how does epilogue make you feel? Right? What a great is very, very much shows the difference between the gender and regular wrestling. This is very much a show. Uh, and we got definitely a very iconic ending in ring, but I, I would argue that we got an even more iconic ending or closer, season closer out of it. Uh, you had the heartwarming moments where, you know, uh, you have. Son of Havoc and Helico and Ivalice kind of going going off separately with one or separately from one another, leaving the doors open for possibly reuniting to get the titles back eventually. Who knows? Uh, you see, and this is my favorite one: the Aerostar and Drago. Just you know, Drago goes off and you know becomes a dragon, and then Aerostar just propels into the heavens just shoots off into the cosmos as they always say he's from the cosmos <laughs> so that that I, I i laughed really really hard at that um and getting to see a little bit more of what might happen with uh, dario cueto and, and black lotus now that black lotus seems to have allied with cueto Seems to at least be following his lead a little bit more. And then, of course, my favorite, Marty the Moth. And his way too much rope. His, his uh, I, I think, completely uh, necessary amount of rope because Sexy Star is, is, of course, a beast. And, you know, also a small. She could wiggle out of a little bit of rope. But if you rope her all the way, what, like, there's no escape. So he's smart. Marty the Moth is a smart man. Oh, also, and then Phoenix is getting into a firebird because he's a firebird. Get it? Get it? <laughs> yeah, that wasn't lost on us, but you know what? Uh, that was kind of... like. Can we agree that was an amazing show? Is there anything more we need to say about this episode? I don't think there's anything else that we, we can say that could even come close to doing it justice. What a great, what a great end of season show, but also what a great, what a great wrestling pay-per-view. Uh, perhaps to all of the people that worked on this for being able to combine those two worlds. Yeah, absolutely. Like I would not be mad if I, if I paid like a, I, you know, the 60 bucks is the normal rate for, 60 bucks used to be the normal rate for a pay-per-view. This was this would have been a $60 pay-per-view. Like all 3 hours put together. It was awesomely done and wow, cannot say enough good things about Lucha Underground season 1. You know what? I think that's what we'll do. Next episode, we will talk good things about Lucha Underground season 1. Whoa. We'll try to find some things to criticize as well. It's hard, but it can be done. But Angie, till next time, let them know where they can find you. All right. I am part of two shows based out of Hawaii, Midcard Mana and Valley Owl Collectors Ringside. Both of us, or both shows have not recorded in a while. So hopefully we're going to try and get the ball back on that. And then also I'm on all social media as Fumiko Mega. And you can find me here. YouTube.com slash Frisco Flame or on tw- Twitter, Instagram as Frisco Flame. You can find me as R. Felix Finch as well. In fact, you'll find me there more often for some reason. You can find this show by just searching for Underground Lucha Things on your favorite podcast app or just in general. Go to Etsy, get our pins. Uh, they're, still, they're still five bucks right now. I've put them up for five bucks. They're still going to be five bucks. I've got, I've got some to get rid of. So, so do what you will. And... Ah, uh, and for Angie, and for myself, peace out, party peoples. I'll see you next time with more underground lucha things. Bang, bang. At least a review of some underground lucha things.